Welcome. This is George O'Keefe, sometimes described as the mother of American modernism, a title she would have hated. She regarded herself as an artist, not a woman artist. Now, we associate her with New Mexico, with its open skies and harsh landscapes, but um, although she lived there later in her life, she was born in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, which is about 120 miles northwest of Chicago. She grew up there on a dairy farm with her six brothers and sisters, and she wanted to be an artist from an early age. When she was 18, she studied at the Art Institute of Chicago, then at the Art Students League in New York, and it was there that she was taught by a famous American artist, William Merritt Chase. In fact, he was one of the most important teachers of American art around that time, and he taught a host of artists who later became famous. It was from him that O'Keeffe learnt the techniques of traditional painting, and in 1908 she won first prize for this painting, Dead Rabbit with Copper Pot. In fact, the um, effect of light on metallic surfaces, such as this copper bowl, was a speciality of her teacher, William Merritt Chase. While she was in New York, uh, she explored the galleries there, so uh, in, including the avant-garde gallery 291, which was owned by her future husband, Alfred Stieglitz, uh, but also the, all the galleries of New York where she saw the work of leading in European artists like Picasso and Braque. Despite winning the prize, she was discouraged by what she felt were the limitations of traditional art. And actually, at this point, when she was 21, she abandoned the idea of becoming an artist. The same year, however, 1908, her father went bankrupt and her mother became seriously ill with tuberculosis, which meant the family couldn't afford to keep her at college. So she took a job in Chicago as a commercial artist but she hated the work. And then measles intervened. She caught measles and had to go back home uh, to convalesce, uh, where her mother was also ill. So it was the two of them together convalescing. And at that point, she decided to become an art teacher. And in fact, the financial security between about 1911 and 1918 uh, helped her. She worked at the University of Virginia. She was a teaching assistant. This is a photograph of her there. She worked in Amarillo, Texas, and it was in um, Texas that she fell in love with the harsh landscape around Amarillo, the hot summers, the strong winds, the cold winters and nights. She said, I was just crazy about all of it, the beauty of that wild world. Now this isn't by her, this is a work by Arthur Wesley Dow, but he was a major influence on O'Keeffe at this time. Remember she'd given up her own painting and was working as a commercial artist, but she decided to attend um, an art summer school at the University of Virginia and when she was there, she was introduced to the art and philosophy of Arthur Wesley Dow. And in fact, in 1914, uh, took a class with him. And it was pivotal to her thinking. She started to draw these charcoal abstractions. It was Dow who'd offered her an alternative to the traditional established way of thinking about art. She realised she didn't have to copy or imitate nature. And she experimented with abstraction for about two years while she was teaching art in Amarillo. She banned herself from using colour. She worked solely in charcoal. And these drawings, this is one example, uh, second out of my head, of her first explorations of abstract art, 
and they enabled her to overcome what she felt was the stifling repression of traditional art. And these charcoal drawings helped her to develop a, a sort of personal language to better express her feelings and ideas. She called them the specials and they were her first authentic, truly original work. Now, she sent some to some of these works to a friend and unknown to her, her friend took them to the 291 Gallery in New York that I mentioned just now, uh, run by the famous, well-known photographer at the time, Alfred Stieglitz. He described them as the purest, finest, sincerest, sincerest things that had entered 291 in a long time. And he exhibited 10 of them, but didn't ask her permission. And when she found out, she was furious that he'd exhibited them without asking her. And she ordered him to take them down, but they got into conversation. They quickly made up and um, she allowed him to continue to exhibit them. Now, Sunrise 1916, by then she'd become the chair of the art department in a college in Canyon, Texas. She would walk in the desert and was inspired by the sunrises, sunsets and the intense colours. She taught during the day and painted in the evening and at night. She painted the plains, the endless skies, the sunrises and sunsets. And here you can see she's reintroduced colour to her work but retained a level of abstraction. Another example based on the scenery and expansive views, it's called Pink and Blue Mountain, but it is it could be seen as completely abstract, although, of course, the horizontal deep blue watercolour with the pink above do echo rounded hill shapes receding into the distance. So it could be seen as a range of mountain tops or a purely abstract work. Remember, this was very early for abstract art. Artists in Europe, such as Hilmar Af Klint, Piet Mondrian, Kazimir Malevich, Vasily Kandinsky, were about this time experimenting for the first time with abstract art. Uh, the following year, she painted a series. This is from that series called Light Coming to the Plains and she's taken another step towards abstraction. In fact, this series, um, the three paintings, were included in a list of the top 10 paintings of the sky ever painted. And this painting was described as one of the purest and most radical images O'Keeffe ever made. Now, 1918, the flag, this, of course, was the during the First World War and her brother, Alexis, was stationed near her college. So she went to see him in the autumn of 1917 as he prepared to uh, travel to join the fighting in Europe. She painted this in the early part of 1918. She was um, she'd caught Spanish flu and was recovering from it. Spanish flu, of course, was the influenza pandemic that killed 20 million people worldwide. Her brother died fighting in France, and this work reflects her feelings at the time. It, it wasn't, in fact, displayed publicly until 1968. We see a wretched, withered flag lacking all the stars and stripes, fluttering aimlessly, smeared in blood. O'Keefe expresses her trauma and discontent against the brutality of the First World War. Now, when she caught Spanish flu, Stieglitz suggested caring for her in Manhattan, that she come to Manhattan so he could look after her, uh, although he was married at the time and he was also more than two decades her senior. He had first fallen in love with her work before he even met her. Um, later, 
when they were apart, they wrote love letters to each other, sometimes two or three a day, some of them up to 40 pages long, and in total there are something like 25,000 pages of love letters. Now, she moved to New York, and their professional relationship quickly led to a personal relationship, and by 1924 to his divorce and their marriage. However, they were very different personalities and the relationship put an enormous strain on her uh, ability to work. He had a frenetic social life, he knew everyone, but she needed peace and calm to work. And he put her on a pedestal, worshipped her, but, but that gave her little room to do her own thing, to move. And as a, prof a photographer, he made her one of the most photographed women of the 20th century. He took some 350 portraits of her and some uh, over 200 nude studies. And it was him, it was Stieglitz, who encouraged her to stop painting in watercolour and switch to oils. As he pointed out to her, watercolour was associated at the time with amateur women artists. So she took her ad his advice. And this is an example, an early oil painting, Blue and Green Music. And she later said the idea that music could be translated into something for the eye is what inspired her here. In this work, colours and forms suggest the natural world and evoke the experience of sound. The forms seem to flow upwards like flames from a cold fire or sounds from an orchestra. She was um, influenced by the theories of the Russian expressionist painter Vasily Kandinsky and in particular his 1912 text concerning the spiritual in art where he argued that visual arts should emulate music in order to achieve pure expression, free of literary and visual references, in other words, uh, abstract art. This is series one, white and blue flower shapes of 1919, one of her early flower paintings. And um, I'll show a number of her paintings and she would become famous for these flower paintings, although I should point out they only account for about 200 of the over 2,000 paintings she created. And this painting leads me into an area that I'll mention just once, but I need to mention it. Many critics and writers have interpreted her flower paintings as a coded reference to uh, female genitalia. However, she denies all sexual associations and wrote, and this is a, a long quote I'll give you, nobody sees a flower, really. It's so small, we haven't time. And to see takes time. So I said to myself, I'll paint what I see, what the flower is to me. I'll paint it big and they will be surprised into taking time to look at it. I will make even busy New Yorkers take time to see what I see of flowers. Well, I made you take time to look, and when you took time, you hung all your own associations with flowers on my flower, and you write about my flower as if I think and see what you think and see of the flower, and I don't." End quote. Now, personally, I respect her opinion. I can see the connection some critics have made, but I feel it's too narrow, too particular an interpretation, and reflects more their personal history. Great works of art throw up a multitude of associations, all of which ricochet around our heads when we see the work. So I'll leave it like that and as she said you could hang all your own associations on her work but remember they're yours not hers. Now this is Red Canner and canners are 
vibrant, tender perennials that produce bold leaves and showy flowers, various colours, reds, oranges, yellows and pinks. And this is one of eight paintings she did of the Red Canna, uh, which she painted between 1919 and 1927. And they all pulse with life, with their intense colour and energy and the swelling and swirling and tapering forms. By this time, she was becoming well known in the New York art world, partly for these works, partly Stieglitz was very well known and introduced her to some of the most uh, well-known artists of the American early modern art movement. Another of her early flower paintings. She's enlarged the flower, this is um, a large work, uh, 90 by 75 centimetre, um, way beyond the actual size of the flower so we can see the smallest detail. Interestingly, when these paintings were first exhibited, even Stieglitz, by then her husband, was shocked by their audacity. He said, I don't know how you're going to get away with anything like that. You aren't planning to show them, are you? Well, she did. And they received rave reviews from the critics. They made her name in New York. And of course, they're now amongst her most celebrated paintings. A couple more. Flowers fascinated O'Keefe at this time and they were her favourite subjects. She liked particular flowers, the lilies, poppies, canna, iris, petunias and, as we'll see in a moment, jimson weed. This work, Oriental Poppies, she painted in 1928 and um, it's a uh, a stunning work which was declared groundbreaking and a masterpiece. I, I couldn't resist showing you a photograph I took, th this photograph I took in my garden yesterday of two giant red poppies. They're about 20 centimetres or eight inches across. And then the final flower painting I'm going to show you, Jimson Weed, White Flower Number One, perhaps her most um, well-known because it made front page headlines worldwide in 2014 when Sotheby's sold the work for over $44 million and it's the most expensive artwork by a female artist ever sold at auction. I should add as a sort of background that at the time, 1932, when she painted this, O'Keefe and Stieglitz both had several affairs, O'Keefe with men and women, and there's some evidence that about this time she had an affair with the famous artist Frida Kahlo. She was married to the artist Diego Rivera and the the two O'Keefe and Carlo met in December 1931 in New York when Rivera had a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. For a while city skylines became her muse. This is Radiator Building Night New York 1927. She painted a lot of them from her apartment, which was on the 30th floor. She started painting them in 1925. And over the years, they go from uh, glitzy city lights like this one to smog filled pieces with little uh, glamour to them. Now, it was in 1927, the year she painted this, that she had surgery for a benign lump in her breast. And the same year, a woman, Dorothy Norman, began to visit Stieglitz's new gallery, The Room. And he was always drawn to pretty women and began an ill-concealed affair with her. This, of course, heightened O'Keefe's feelings of um, the restrictions of their relationship. And she began to take increasingly long trips to New, Me New Mexico. The separation actually helped her work in the late 1920s and early 
thirties are filled with her masterpieces and by then her work was already commanding extremely high prices and she was being exhibited in major exhibitions and even solo retrospectives. In 1929 she travelled to New Mexico with a woman friend, Rebecca Strand, and they went on hiking trips in the mountains and deserts together. She loved hiking and she, she was hiking into the mountains into her old age. Part of that um, trip to New Mexico, she visited the D.H. Lawrence Ranch, where she painted this now famous work, The Lawrence Tree. Now, D.H. Lawrence and his wife Frida lived in a cabin near this large ponderosa pine. Uh, by the way, as an aside, the Lawrences went to America in 1922 to set up a utopian society. Let me give you um, a quote I've got here from D.H. Lawrence. I want to gather together about 20 souls and sail away from this world of war and squalor and found a little colony where there shall be no money but a sort of communism as far as the necessities of life go and some real decency, a place where one can live simply apart from this civilization with a few other people who are also at peace and happy and live and understand and be free. End quote. Now, unfortunately, he had an attack of malaria and tuberculosis, which meant he had to return to Europe and he went to live in northern Italy, which is where he wrote his last major novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover. But he did briefly return to New Mexico in 1929, which is uh, where and when he met O'Keefe. She painted this lying down on a bench under the tree looking up through the branches to the night sky and the orientation of the painting is therefore ambiguous but she told the Wadsworth Gallery that it should be hung like this with the treetop at the bottom and you'll sometimes see it this way up in books and on websites uh, perhaps a more conventional view but we know from what she told the Wadsworth that it should be hung this way up, the way I'm showing it. Black Cross, 1929. Now, by 19, from 1929, she spent a large part of every year in New Mexico and she would drive on her own, drive her specially adapted Ford Model A across the Badlands and paint from the seat of her car and collect specimens like skulls from the desert floor and bring them back to her studio. The car was specially adapted in the sense that the, the front seats could easily be taken out and she would use it as a mini studio and she worked inside the car to avoid the burning desert sun and the insects. She'd also paint under tarpaulins when it rained and she would wear gloves to paint when it got freezing cold. She would camp in the desert, in fact she went camping well into her 70s. Now she painted a series of crosses which she said for her was a way of painting the country and here she contrasts the black cross with the brilliant sunset beyond the rolling hills. She was fascinated with these crosses that dot the southwest landscape. She said, anyone who doesn't feel the crosses simply doesn't get that country. Now, I've given you some quotes, but over the years, she actually said very little about her paintings. But in 1976, much later, she wrote that black and white, which was an earlier version of this painting, Black, White and Blue, was a message to a friend. If he saw it, he didn't know it was to him and he wouldn't have known what it said. And neither do I. 
end quote. The friend was most likely Tony Luhan, a Native American, someone she knew in New Mexico, and he didn't often, as far as we know, he may never have seen her paintings. She expressed herself in colour and form, and the, for her the act of painting was a little way of clarifying her experiences. So when she said she didn't know what the message was, she wasn't being coy or clever. She didn't know. She was being accurate. Her painting was a way of coming to terms with, of knowing and understanding and experience. As she repeatedly insisted, her paintings embodied, quote, things that I had no words for, the intangible thing in myself that I can only clarify in paint. Cow Skull, Red, White and Blue, 1931, another motif often used by O'Keefe. This is a single skull with its jagged edges, worn surfaces, sun-bleached colour. And to her, such bones represented the desert's enduring beauty and the strength of the American spirit. The bones represented the hard, tough land she loved, stripped to its bare essentials. Meanwhile, in her personal life, the love triangle, her, her husband and Dorothy Norman, who incidentally was married, reached a crisis in 1932. What happened was there was a series of events. She was commissioned to paint a public mural in New York, but Stieglitz hated public works and tried to stop her and at the same time he was trying to persuade her to be more friendly to his mistress. She fought against him and then discovered that the public mural that she was dying to paint she couldn't paint because the plaster wasn't dry, she broke down, she couldn't eat, she cried for days and was hospitalised for psychoneurosis. So she didn't work from 1932 to 1935, but towards the end of the breakdown, she realised that it was the compromises she'd been making that had almost destroyed her. So she now focused entirely on her work. She spent every summer in New Mexico and in the winter in New York, she avoided, she didn't attend the social events that Stieglitz um, attended. She returned to work invigorated and after her first visit to Ghost Ranch north of Abiquiu in New Mexico and she would um, visit it again and again and after her husband's death she would uh, move permanently to New Mexico in 1946. She was um, increasingly happy and increasingly happy with their relationship, although he, Stieglitz, um, missed her. And it was then that they, when she was in New Mexico, that they wrote these long letters to each other, his letters tormented by uh, her not being there. In this work, Summer Days, she shows again a skull and several southwestern flowers above a barren desert landscape. She's including the symbols of the cycles of life and death that shape the natural world. And together with the, the floating skull and the flowers, it has a surreal quality. As I said, she collected deer, horse, mule, steer skulls in a car the same way uh, someone would gather wildflowers, but for her they were potent souvenirs of the landscape and they deeply inspired her. She said, the bones cut sharply to the centre of something that is keenly alive in the desert. In 1946, ten years after she painted this, she had a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, 
the first for a woman artist. But it was in that year that Stieglitz had a seizure. Now, at first, he seemed to be recovering. She remained at Ghost Ranch, New Mexico, but he then had a massive stroke and she immediately flew back, but had to take it in turns at his bedside with his lover, Dorothy Norman. He died shortly after. He had asked to be buried with one of her watercolours blue lines, but um, in the event she refused. And she also banished Dorothy Newman from Norman, sorry, from the gallery for good. Now, it was during her visits to New Mexico in the 1930s that she began to obsess over a wall with a door in it in a courtyard of a farm in Abiquiu. She bought the house eventually for $10, but spent 10 years um, rebuilding it. And she created over that period almost 20 works recording the door. She said, I'm always trying to paint that door. I never quite get it. It's a curse the way I feel. I must continually go on with that door. And this is a version of that door in the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. By, by the way, she was by then in her late 60s and as she became older, she became increasingly cantankerous. She would argue with friends and staff. She would argue with everybody. She would alternate between spending days in the desert in her Ford car, making sketches. She would then retreat to her studio to work. In the winter, she would sometimes return to Manhattan where she would paint sketches, uh, sorry, paint from her sketches and from memory and to capture the heart of the landscape here, ladder to the moon, painted at dusk, we see a ladder which seems to take us away to a distant magical land. Sky above the clouds four. Her last great series was painted in the mid 1960s. Let me explain. By the 1960s and 70s, she was a wealthy and famous artist. And in 1972, she noticed on the way home, the world looked grey, even though the sun was shining. She went to a doctor and found she was um, suffering from macular degeneration and eventually lost most of her eyesight. She spent years traveling the globe for months at a time followed by bouts of working and painting in New Mexico. And she made these large scale cloud works in her garage in Abiquiu in 1965, inspired by the view of clouds from aeroplane, an aeroplane window. She made her last unassisted oil painting in 1972. And it was that year that a beautiful young man, John Hamilton, called on her. At first, she, she didn't want to see him. She didn't like visitors, uh, but he insisted. And then, despite the fact that he was 27 and she was in her 80s, she uh, doted on him. He took control of her finances. Um, he lived with her for years, and in 1978, she gave him power of attorney. He immediately went out and bought a mansion and three Mercedes. By 1984, she'd given up drawing entirely because of her lack of eyesight. Uh, she moved to Santa Fe that year and she died two years later in 1986, aged 98. Now, when she died, a codicil to her will was found that left most of her $65 million estate to Hamilton. But it then emerged from uh, testimonies from her staff that she'd signed the codicil, believing they were getting married, and it was a document 
to marry them. So her family went to court and eventually he agreed to hand over uh, part of the estate to create a non-profit Georgia O'Keeffe Foundation, which is still in existence. In some ways, a sad note on which to end this talk, but let us remember her as one of the key founders of American modernism. She said, I have but one desire as a painter, that is to paint what I see as I see it in my own way, without regard for the desires or taste of the professional dealer or the professional collector. And let me end with a piece of advice from her aimed at everyone. If you're worried about taking on a new project or making a major change to your life, remember what she said. I've been absolutely terrified every moment of my life. But I've never let it keep me from doing a thing that I wanted to do. Thank you.